Thank you for this kind introduction. Good morning, everybody. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. It is a great pleasure for me to come here and to be with you. My topic is MAC extended tolerance of laryngoscopy and noxious stimulation response index. Here is my conflict of interest. Uh, statement. I am collaborating with Drag Medical and I have been involved in the development of the Smart Pilot system for more than 10 years now. Well, what I am talking about is actually not a new concept. It is rather old. Already 40 years ago, uh, the MAC of Halothane has been published and the concept that with increasing halothane concentrations, the number of patients moving on surgical incision will decreasing is not a new concept. And therefore, the, the principle that the probability of a response can be considered as a depth of indica anesthesia indicator uh, is not new. If we uh, replace, for instance, the number of patients not moving on incision, uh, we can say probability of tolerance. Uh, the C50, the concentration at which 50% of patients move or don't move, is the MAC. And the C95, the concentration where 95% of the patients tolerate incision, equals about 1.2 MAC. Now, we are not anesthetizing patients only with volatile anesthetics or only with hypnotics, but we also use opioids. But first, let's talk about probabilities uh, based on another study. Uh, here, we are talking about probability of response to verbal command. On, on the y-axis, you see the probability of response, and on the x-axis, you see the sevoflurane concentrations with nice uh, sigmoid hill curves. In the same study, also, the bispectral index was recorded, and what you see here is a linear relationship between the bis and increasing sevoflurane concentration. And no wonder if you plot the BIS and the probability of response, you see the reciprocal hill curves as you have seen uh, already in the beginning. Also, in the use of anesthetic depth monitors, we are speaking about probabilities, not about complete certainty. The same is true for propofol concentrations. Here, a paper from Michel, 13 years ago, uh, you see uh, the prediction probability, which means the probability that the sedation state is correctly predicted is equal uh, if you use the bispectral index as a predictor and if you use the effect side propofol concentration as a predictor. So I talked about other medications, other drugs than hypnotics. Therefore, we need an extension of the MAC principles by opioids. There is extensive previous data available in the literature, for instance, the effect of fentanyl on isoflurane MAC, the effect of fentanyl on sevoflurane MAC, the effect of alfentanyl on isoflurane MAC, the effect of remifentanyl, and also of sufentanil. All the information is available in the literature, but not available in clinical practice, because we cannot uh, relate the patient and his concentrations uh, to the isoballs we see here on these plots. Information is also available on propofol and opioid effect, also 20 years ago, almost, we see the 95% isoball and we see the 50% isoball. You see the same concept, 95% probability, 50% probability. And actually, the patient moves on a response surface, which is illustrated on the next slide. This is a study by Thomas Bouillon, from 2004, he anesthetized volunteers with propofol and remifentanil, and 
stimulated them first with non-noxious stimuli, loud uh, verbal command and, and gentle shaking. And then if they tolerated this, they, he applied laryngoscopy. These are the two response surfaces with propofol concentration, remifentanil concentrations on the X and Y axis, and on the Z axis, the probability of tolerance, the probability of hypnosis on the left side, and the probability of tolerant, tolerating laryngoscopy uh, on the right side. The black line in the middle represents the 50% isobol we have seen uh, on the other slides before. The basis of this response surface was uh, the sequential interaction model. The sequential interaction model says that we use opioids, opioids for analgesia. Opioids reduce an incoming noxious stimulus uh, which is then uh, where the, the, the neurologic impulse coming from, from the spinal cord to the brain are reduced due to the effect of, uh, of the opiates. So that in order to get the patient unresponsive, less hypnotic drug uh, is needed. You see here the two graphics. Uh, here. Okay. Here, the incoming stimulus of a certain intensity, which is reduced by the opioid, probably or eventually to one half at the opioid concentration C50, and the projected stimulus on the brain um, has to be suppressed by a certain amount of hypnotic. If the stimulus increases, for instance, if you uh, perform a laryngoscopy instead of shaking and shouted, shouting, uh, the dose response curve of the opioid is moving uh, to the right, and if you give some more opioid, the dose response curve is moving to the left again. Here is the mathematics behind. I don't want to uh, spend too much time on these formula, but um, Down here, you see the general formula of, uh, of the hill curve with the slope parameter, and here with the total potency of the combination of an opioid and the hypnotic, and which equals the probability of tolerance of a certain stimulus. In our case, mostly laryngoscopy. It may also be skin incision. Okay, now anesthesia display systems make these informations available in clinical practice. They integrate the dosing history from infusion pumps, amount of drug administered over time. They integrate volatile anesthetics and they integrate anesthetic drugs injected as boluses. And they first of all use pharmacokinetic dynamic models that calculate effect site concentrations of the drugs that are applied. And they then plot uh, the effect site concentrations on a two-dimensional graph. At least the smart pilot does this. And you see the current position of the patient at a certain moment of anesthesia in relation to isoboles. In this case here, the MAC isoboles, 90% tolerance of skin incision, 50% tolerance of skin incision. And on the x-axis of the display are shown the opioid concentrations. And if you, are, if you uh, use two opioids, fentanyl, fentanyl and remifentanyl, the user can identify how much of the opioid components consists of the longer-acting fentanyl, fentanyl and how much consists of the short-acting remifentanyl. The same is true for hypnotics if you use propofol and later 
uh, volatile and aesthetic, you can also differentiate uh, how much volatile you have on the hypnotic component and how much propofol you have. The system displays the effect site concentration over time and makes a prediction over the next 20 minutes based on the, the amount of drug that this is, is administered uh, until now and, and the, the assumption that the same amount uh, over time is, is administered in the future. And on the graphical display, the patient uh, moves uh, on a trajectory uh, along these isoballs and can be up, titrated up and titrated down. Okay. Now, what is the noxious stimulation response index? When we discussed about uh, anesthesia displays and relating anesthetic depth to isoballs, we had also the idea uh, to define uh, an index between 0 and 100, representing the total potency of the administered drugs as a number. And the noxious stimulation responding in index, the NSRI, as published in 2010, is nothing else than a mathematical transformation of tolerance to laryngoscopy uh, with the formula you see here um, on the bottom. And what it does, it stretches uh, the scale a bit in the deeper level of anesthesia in order, because uh, if you would say you can also titrate according to tolerance of laryngoscopy, then uh, you move between uh, around the 90% scale, and if you stretch the scale a bit, uh, differenti differentiation is a bit more simple. In 2010, we validated the NSRI with data from Michel again. And um, Michel did a study in two th published in 2003 on 45 women anesthetized with propofol and remifentanil. And he recorded observer assessment of sedation score. He recorded presence or absence of eyelash reflex. And he recorded also presence or absence of a response, a motor response to tetanic stimulation. What you see here is that the endpoints reflecting hypnosis are better predicted by propofol concentration and by uh, the EEG and uh, depth of anesthesia indicators. Uh, although the NSRI and tolerance to laryngoscopy are not so bad, whereas the noxious Stimulus is better predicted uh, by NSRI and tolerance to laryngoscopy and a bit less well by the EEG parameters. Later on, Falk von Dinklage performed a study on nociceptive reflex threshold, which is uh, an electrical test uh, where the response uh, um, on, on nervous stimulation uh, is recorded and he investigated this as depth of anesthesia indicator and of course he, he compared uh, his tool with the bispectral index, the CVI and also the NSRI and the calculated effect site concentrations. He uh, enrolled 50 female subjects undergoing breast surgery, he anesthetized them with propofol and remifentanil and he investigated the prediction probability, the prediction of movement and heart rate response to LMA insertion and skin incision. And these are the results. The nociceptive flexion reflex uh, threshold performed quite well in both uh, stimuli in LMA insertion and skin incision with a prediction probability which was a bit lower than we had, but nevertheless better than the EEG indicators. And the NSRI performed n not very well at LMA inser insertion, which was, was quite early in anesthesia, but it performed better with uh, skin incision. The same uh, had the same prediction probability as the 
NFRT. And this illustrates a bit the potential weakness of a purely pharmacologic anesthetic depth indicator because if the predicted effect site concentrations are not accurate enough due to instability of the pharmacology during induction where concentrations are rapidly changing, the prediction may not be accurate, whereas at skin incision, which occurs a quarter of an hour or a half an hour um, after induction, the patient is more in steady state and therefore the prediction uh, might be more accurate. We used preliminary uh, data from a pilot study we did in the development of Smart Pilot and which has not been published, where we anesthetized orthopedic patients with propofol and alfentanil and titrated according to the, an the discretion of the anesthesiologist. We calculated predicted effect site concentration with the Scott and Stansky model and converted alfentanil to remifentanil at the ratio of 66 to 1 based on EG potency. And what did we see? At intubation, uh, we looked at MAP at the mean arterial pressure response and defined the responder as a patient who had an increase of more than 50% and the non-responder as a, a one with less than 50% blood pressure increase. B's spectral en entropy, response entropy at intubation between responders and non-responders were the same. NSRE was significantly lower in non-responders as where propofol concentrations were higher and alfentanil concentrations were higher too. The discrimination at skin incision was even larger and which was mainly due to different alfentanil concentrations. This is reflected by the prediction probabilities um, which were near 80% correct prediction of MAP increase. The current smart pilot view as implemented now uses the laryngoscopy isovolts for propofol and therefore the NSRI refers to tolerance of laryngoscopy whereas with volatile anesthetics the smart pilot uses the MAC isovolts and consequently NSRI refers to MAP. This means that equal numbers of NSRI with volatiles ones and with propofol may not necessarily represent equal potency. And in contrast to EEG depth of anesthesia indicators where a, a certain target range is recommended, 40 to 60 for Bs for instance, we do not recommend uh, a definite target range for NSRI, but we say that um, anesthesia has to be titrated according to clinical effect. We cannot say that an NSRI of 30 is sufficient in every patient. It may be uh, a reasonable starting point, but at the end we need to titrate according to the patient's response. What is the future de development? Um, what is a bit annoying that is that between the NSRI volatile and the NSRI propofol is not uh, completely the same. Therefore, we are looking for a common basis related to tolerance of laryngoscopy. And actually, we have three studies that have been performed by members of our group which have common features in that a series of stimuli of increasing intensity has been applied. Uh, drug interaction has been studied with a crisscross design and stimulation was analyzed at the pharmacologic pseudo steady state. And the result is a common model. I will skip this uh, formula, but you, you recognize here again uh, the probability of tolerance is dependent on the total potency of the two or the three drugs in this case. And in an internal uh, cross-validation, or this is, this is the model estimates, the parameter estimates of the pooled fit in comparison with the single studies, where you see all in all an averaging of the C50 
of sevoflurin, of the C50 of propofol, and the C50 of remifentanil. And you see also, sorry, an averaging of the slope of the response surface. An internal validation showed that, again, as in the previous validation, sedative endpoints as response to shaking and shouting is best predicted by EEG monitors, whereas noxious stimuli such as tetanic stimulation, LMA insertion, and laryngoscopy is better predicted by the NSRI. In conclusion, the NSRI is a number between 100 and 0. It is a pharmacologic depth of anesthesia indicator, not a measured indicator. And it is calculated from predicted effect site concentrations. Currently, it refers to tolerance of laryngoscopy with propofol and to MAC with volatile anesthetics. Display systems such as the smart pilot view may facilitate a differentiated drug titration according to clinical effect. You can see where the total potency of your drugs is, and we can, you can also see uh, how this total potency is composed. Do you have a lot of short-acting anesthetics? Do you have a lot of long-acting anesthetics? And where is, and, and it may facilitate uh, planning of the emergence of, of the patient so that the patient can titrate it to uh, a sufficient concentration of long-acting uh, opioids for post-operative analgesia. In the future, a triple interaction model will be applied and is proposed for the future, but clinical validation of this system and of this model is needed. Thank you for your attention.